Hello YouTube and welcome to an all new Elder Scrolls lore video. This time on the Celestials, powerful creatures harnessing the power of the constellations. Now quickly before we begin, the lore in this video at some moments will feel like a fever dream as it's in many ways nothing like anything else we have in the Elder Scrolls lore and can be a bit weird or counterintuitive. Especially since I first tried to cover what lore and story we have from the Elder Scrolls Online and only afterwards tried to make sense of it a bit by theorizing so. Be warned and watch till the end, that's all well, my message from the beginning. Alright, so the Celestials. Now, here's the thing. We don't know what the hell they are, but here's what we do know and what happens in the game. So, first of all, most of us know that in the skies above Tamriel there are 13 constellations of stars, sometimes called birth signs. Now, these 13 are ordered in the following manner. You have three guardian constellations or major constellations, which are the Thief, the Warrior and the Mage. Now each of these three have three minor constellations under their protection, so that gives us three major constellations, each with three minor constellations under their protection. Each have their own fixed place in the sky and they contain some sort of power as the constellation, which is dominant in the sky during one's birth, can actually give the individual some form of boon, which is why we call them the birth signs. However, three major constellations with each three minor constellations gives us 12 constellations, while we have 13. You see, the final constellation in the sky above Nern is the Serpent, which is an extra presence in the constellations and according to some religious beliefs is actually an invader trying to eat the other constellations. It's said in some religions that the grouping of the stars, the three major constellations, each protecting three minor ones, happened because the major constellations, the Warrior, the Mage and the Thief, protect the other constellations against the influence of the Serpent. Because the serpent threatens them all, as the serpent constellation darts across the night sky never in one place, making the people born under the serpent relatively random as to who they are. How stars move across the sky in this constellation, well, we don't know. But what we do know is that some lore suggests that the serpent is made out of so-called unstars with other properties than regular stars. But that's a rabbit hole we are not delving into in this video. Because this is where the conventional lore basically ends. As everything before this point, so on the constellations is just regular Elder Scrolls lore, but here we go. So, it's told to us in the Elder Scrolls Online's Craglorn DLC that the constellations in the sky are not just a fixed formation of stars in the night sky, but they are actual, almost godlike beings. These beings even have the capability of entering Mundus, so the mortal plane, in a physical form which causes their relating stars to disappear from the night sky while they were on Mundus. Fucking what? Are the writers high? What's going on? Because if you're a bit into the Elder Scrolls lore or watch my introduction to Elder Scrolls lore video, you would think, but the stars are not physical beings, the stars are the holes in the Mundus left when the Magna Gi left creation, the holes they ripped in creation began the stars, which radiate magical energy into the mortal plane from Aetherius, enabling mortals to use magic along with the sun. So, how can these fixed holes be creatures and how can they disappear when these creatures are on Tamriel? Well, yeah, starting to understand why I said at the start that this is weird, well, there are some explanations. All of them are theories, as the writers of the Cracklorn DLC never truly bothered to explain everything. But let's first go over what's actually in the Cracklorn story, as it provides us with some clues as to what might actually be going on. So, in the Craglorn DLC, you, the player, are called to Craglorn by this group of researchers calling themselves the Stargazers. They conduct research into the constellations and their effect on Mundus. And, well, let's just say that they are in a bit of a pickle and need some help, because the Warrior, the Mage, the Serpent and the Thief constellations have all disappeared from the night sky, and at the same time, these almost godlike beings, calling themselves Celestials, have started to terrorize the region. There is the Celestial Serpent at the head of a cult, which follows the teachings of the Serpent, which is called the Skilled Court. Uh, the Serpent has not been seen in the region, but rumors of his presence are heard as the Skilled Court. His followers are suddenly far more active than they've ever been. But the other two Celestials are definitely active. The Celestial Mage and the Celestial Warrior, which are both terrorizing the region. While the Celestial Thief, which has also disappeared from the night sky, is nowhere to be found on Tamriel or in the sky. 
Now, the stargazers immediately come to the conclusion that these godlike creatures are the constellations which have taken a physical form and have fallen from the sky to Tamriel, as they've done so before in history. And every time they came down to Tamriel as these sort of benevolent demigods. But not now, because now they are terrorizing the region. And the stargazers think that the reason why the mage and the warrior are terrorizing the region is because the serpent has finally succeeded in defeating them after the eons long battle across the sky. This is basically confirmed by the Celestial Thief, the missing constellation who appears to you, the player, as a projection. Because the Thief tells you that it was the Serpent who broke free from the heavens first, deciding to descend upon Tamriel. The three major constellations then followed him down to Tamriel trying to stop him. But the Serpent was prepared and he managed to ensnare the Mage and the Warrior as they landed on Tamriel. The Warrior almost immediately fell while the Mage split herself into several forms to evade capture. Unfortunately, some of these forms of the mage were actually captured by the serpent and like the warrior started to terrorize the region. Meanwhile, the thief managed to barely escape and immediately went into hiding as her power alone would not be enough to fight against the serpent and the two other major constellations under his control. The thief then asks you to help her stop the serpent who is chaos in nature and wishes to cause havoc on the entire world. And you're gonna do this by doing three things. Stopping the serpent's direct servants, the scaled cords, then freeing the celestial mage and the celestial warrior, uh, their physical forms from the serpent's control, and finally defeat the physical manifestation of the serpent himself. So this is what you're gonna do. First you investigate the skilled court and as you investigate and return to the stargazers with some of your findings you witness that the celestial thief is, be is finally being found by the serpent's servants after first evading capture for a few weeks. Now before getting captured the thief urges you to find her apex stone under Belkarth. Now these apex stones are important because they are ancient Nidic artifacts. The Nids are the original ancestors of most of the human races. Now, these Apex Stones were specifically made by the Nidic Star Cult, a sect of Nids which worship the stars. Now, these Apex Stones they made, according to the Thief, are the reasons why the constellations are even able to take physical forms in the mortal plane in the first place. Which is very important, as that opens up some interesting questions for the theories at the end of this video. Now, when you descend into the ruins of an ancient Nidic city below Belkarth, you find out that the Skilled Court, so the followers of the Serpents, are trying to corrupt the Thief's Apex Stone, and that's why she got captured by them. But fortunately, you managed to stop them in time, and then keep the Thief from the Serpent's corruption. You then continue your investigation into the Skilled Court, and find out that one of their commanders, Regent Cassipia, is trying to stop the Serpent as well from the inside, as she got disillusioned with the Skilled Court when the Serpent actually appeared to them, as the Serpent revealed that it's his goal to destroy the current version of Tamriel and start over to a world ruled by nature, animals and primeval spirits. And he then ordered the Skilled Court to make an army of monsters to overrun the world after sharing with them some ancient methods involving Nurncrux to magically create powerful monsters like Manticoras. Magics not seen on the face of Tamriel since the times of the Nidic Star Cult. Again, remember this. This is important for the theories. Now, together with this region Cassipia, you try to stop the Skilled Court's operations. But lo and behold, you get betrayed by her. As it turns out that the reason that she betrays her people is not because she wants the world to be free of the serpent, but because in some ancient Nidic book she apparently found a way to gain the power of a celestial herself. So she wants to destroy the Skilled Court and the serpent and then take his place in the sky as a celestial constellation and then remake the world into her image, which according to her is better than the one that we have now and a better image than the serpent's image. So go her now the thief then tells you that this is very very dangerous as those magics that Cassipia wants to use have been lost since the time of the needs for a reason again remember this anyway when you confront Cassipia, and she actually does manage to complete the ritual which would turn her into one of those celestials before you arrive now she calls herself the exalted viper celestial a new constellation but before she can ascend or do anything you manage to defeat her and deny her ascension now, this is all very interesting and you do need to remember it for the theorizing, but we're not done yet with the story, so let's complete that first. Because after dealing with the Exalted Viper, you go after the Celestial Warrior. Now, it's revealed that the being that's called the Celestial Warrior has the power to summon warriors to his side from across time and space to help him out using a great war horn, and that the serpent has forced the warrior to summon the ancient Yukun Emperor Teresh Z from the past to the present to fight for them. 
You see, this Teresh Z was a Yakudan warlord of the Ankara, a Yakudan army from the Ragada, who had proclaimed himself to be emperor after conquering parts of Hammerfell, among which was Kranglorn, during the great Yakudan migration to Tamriel. When he proclaimed himself emperor, he had all his soldiers swear a magical oath to him, an oath of eternal loyalty to always come when the emperor called. This meant that when the ancient emperor was called to the corrupted warrior's side, his ancient Ankara warriors, bound by their magical oaths, were forced to rise from their graves and also fight for the corrupted warrior Celestial. Fortunately for you, just before the warrior was corrupted by the serpent and caught by him, he'd used his own power to call upon one of his most loyal followers, the ancient warrior Titus Valerius, who came from Tars V time to help you counter the ancient emperor and the warrior's forces and the serpent's forces. Now, Titus Valerius and his story with the ancient Emperor Tyrus Z is honestly one of the best aspects of the quest line, but to keep it focused on the Celestials and who and what they actually are, let's save that for its own video, as it's definitely video material. Anyway, you fight some of the ancient Emperor's forces and eventually you go to the Hellras Citadel, a Yakun fortress hidden for thousands of years, where the warrior is gathering the ancient Ankara army of Emperor Tyrus Z for the serpent to overrun the world. Now you then have to fight the physical form of the warrior and by defeating him free him from the serpent's corruption with some help from the celestial thief. Now with the warrior and the thief both at your side it's then time to go after the mage celestial. Remember how in order to evade full corruption by the serpent she split herself into multiple aspects? Well, you find several aspects of the Celestial Mage which are not yet under the control of the Serpents and with those aspects help you attempt to finally partially gain control over the aspect of the Mage terrorizing Craglorn, so the one under the Serpent's corruption. However, this only partially works as the parts of the Mage under control of the Serpent remain under his control even after the free aspects fuse with the aspects under the Serpent's control. But those free aspects then force the other aspects to flee to a place called the Aetherian Archives where the divided mage partially under the control of the serpent tries to contain herself from doing anyone harm by locking herself in the archives. You then have to battle the mage at the top of the Aetherian archives and with the help of the Lester Celestial Thief the serpent's corruption is driven from her, freeing her fully. Then with the three major constellations all free from the serpent's control you head for the headquarters of the Skilled Court. The Sanctum Ovida, which is where the Serpent himself is hiding with his followers. Now, as you explore the Sanctum, it's revealed that Cassipia was right and that the Serpent indeed wants to destroy civilization, remove all intelligent mortals from Nern and remake Nern into its original state and give it back to the plants, animals and primeval spirits. In that dungeon you can also find the book discussing on whether Cyrodiil was once a jungle or not and the serpent says that jungles like that will cover civilization, so it seems that his goal was to reverse the junglification which is a whole lore debate on itself but you know why he wants this we don't even know it's never really explained but we do know that just like the other celestials the reason he is able to be on Nern is because he's bound by his apex stone so he's still defeatable so you fight him you defeat him and then the three major constellations appear and then place a powerful seal on the serpent launching him back into the heavens preventing him from ever descending back to Tamriel. The other constellations then also resume their place in the night sky. <laughs> so what the hell of a fever dream was this? Like honestly I looked up a lot of lore threads online to see whether anyone had made sense of this questline and the general consensus seems to be that whoever wrote this was either a coked up ferret or a human writer tripping on acid and never looked at a lore book on Mundus creation and cosmology. And well I'm half inclined to agree with them but there are some prevailing theories which I'd like to present to you and something that I like about this. Although it's not much. Now, here are the three general theories that I've been seeing. My personal theory and the one shared by quite some people online is that the beings that we see as the celestial constellations are actually mortal needs of the star cult who ascended to the heavens as demigods with great power using the ancient ritual that Cassipia tried to use to become the exalted viper. These mortals then found themselves to be trapped in those forms, the demigods in the heavens, and they were drawing their power from the existing stars, forming them into constellations as they ascended, then only being able to descend back to Nern temporarily using those apex stones. Some interesting evidence for this is that in a flashback where you can witness the celestial mage being ensnared by the celestial serpent, she calls him not by his celestial serpent name, but she calls him Malazar, a mortal name, and he calls her Vala, also a mortal name indicating that they had some sort of identity before they became Celestials. 
Further evidence for this is found in the Skyreach Pinnacle, an ancient Nidic laboratory where the Nids experimented with star power and Nurn Crux and created immensely powerful creatures out of star power. Now, this theory states that those were simply experiments for the ultimate aim to bring someone of their own up to the heavens to become demigods in control of the stars and their power. They then ended up designing the ritual which Cassipia also used and sent some of their own to the heavens where they formed the stars into constellations and these newly ascended celestials then controlled the power from the stars somehow. This formation of the stars into constellations and the needs and other races because some of them actually seem to be other races than needs even though it's a needed ritual but sure became avatars of their power which would have marked the start of the constellations becoming birth signs and giving mortals a boon upon birth. So that would be due to the influence of these mortals who have ascended to the heavens. Now, Melazar in this theory was someone not intended to ascend to the heavens and secretly using the ritual anyway to become a celestial, despite there being no room for him in the skies in the original plan, which caused him to become the invader, so the serpent who darts across the sky. Now, that's the first theory. The second theory I've seen is that the constellations already were beings of themselves, but then the Needs created the Apex Stones to summon them down to Tamriel, bind them to the Needs' will, and then mantle them, replacing the original beings with their own people and, again, some other races for some reason. So they stole the original creature's power and then they also stole their place among the heavens. This theory states that the original celestials may have been minor Magna Ghi, the spirits who fled with Magnus out of creation, and that they remained at Mundus Edge to guard the stars, but then were captured by the Apex Stones and replaced by mortals who coveted their power. Now, the third theory states that there were always 12 star signs which had sort of demigods made of ethereal energy to them, uh, these are the constellation celestials, they either are minor Magna Ghi or creatures existing out of pure magical leftover energy from the Mag Magna Ghi fleeing Mundus, but this theory states that the Nidic star cult worshipped these creatures specifically and then created the apex stones to allow the celestial constellations to descend to Nurn and live among them. This went well for a time and these creatures even gave themselves mortal names, but then a mortal need named Malazar designed a ritual which allowed him to become a creature similar to a celestial and also ascend to the heavens using a corrupted apex stone. This inserted him to the heavens as the celestial serpent, forcing the other major celestials to then also return to the heavens to protect the other stars from Malazar. I honestly don't know which it is. Uh, this whole piece of the lore is just a bit weird, but what do you think the truth is on this one? I mean, any of the theories or can be valid or maybe you have your own? Let me know in the comments. I honestly don't know and this has all been absolutely one big fever dream, I think. What I do like about it though is the hint that none of Elder Scrolls cosmology is to be believed at face value, which... I support, but the way they handled it is definitely weird, uh, but I do like the suggestion that none of Elder Scrolls cosmology and metaphysics is to be taken at face value, as a lot of it is from far before the events that we witness in any of the games. I mean, I once had this theory about creation myths being half-remembered orally passed down stories about an ancient time instead of there actually being gods, and that the whole idea of Kalpas came from the half-remembered world before. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's a bad theory, and that's the reason why I never made a video on it, because it doesn't really make sense. But that theory serves to illustrate the point that every metaphysical book and every Elder Scrolls book on religion serves the role of being an unreliable narrator, so nothing can be taken at face value. So those holes in Mundus that the Magna Ghi left, I mean, yeah, sure, that's accepted in most versions of creation myths, but it's still an unreliable narrator. I mean, indeed, maybe these celestials have nothing to do with that story, and perhaps the story of creation that we know is simply not true, and then the celestials gave us a glimpse into the real functioning of the Elder Scrolls world. Perhaps the stars indeed are these beings. I mean, that's what I like about this questline, as it really reminds me of how unreliable metaphysical texts and religious texts are designed to be in the Elder Scrolls universe. But still, this was a very weird questline, and I would not be surprised if it all gets retconned eventually. But you know, they did have something uh, on their minds while making this, because the original concepts for the Celestial Warrior, for example, was the Red Guard Gold Ebonarm, who I made a video on. So at first they had an idea with fit, which fit into actual Elder Scrolls lore and then they made this so it's not, it's not like the writers didn't know Elder Scrolls lore existed they just decided to do something else entirely meaning that there may still be some value to this although they haven't really acknowledged this happening ever since Crackle on release so that's why I think it may get retconned and that's why I think that 
probably they themselves don't want much to do with this part of the lore unless I'm really wrong but you know uh, until then we have this story and we have to accept it being there and for now all that rests me is to thank you for watching and hoping that you learned something new today about the Elder Scrolls lore and if you did maybe consider returning the next weekend when I probably make another video and now, all that rests me is to vocally thank my top Patreon supporters, Mr. Bernardo Binda, Gabriel Binda, Polaris Putin, Athena Hayotis, King Chris, Bolt, Scarf of the Scrolls, Doji, Fenrir, Sort of Bushido, Rakai, Sar Mikael, and Mr. Christmas. It's thanks to all these people and all the others on screen that this channel stays alive, and for that, I'm very grateful. That said, I hope to see all of you in the next Elder Scrolls lore video. Bye-bye.